we're back out here once again. And today we're talking about the most common question I've been getting asked here recently. Lobro, where are you finding all those fish that you've been catching here lately? And how do I do that on my fishery? Well, stick around. We're going to talk all about it. Oh, there we go. I got him. That's not a bad one. That's a pretty good one right there. Another one on the fluke. There we go. Ooh. Come on, you. And here is this video's featured comment. Congratulations! If you would like to have a chance to have your comment featured in an upcoming video, all you've got to do is leave a comment. And now, on with the video. Welcome back to Lowbrow Fishing. And so far this pre-spawn, I have been exceptionally fortunate. Not only have I caught a lot of fish, but I have caught some really nice sized fish. Fish in that three plus, four plus pound bass, you know, and I will take those all day, every day. Now, we've talked about some of the things that I'm doing when I'm out on the water. What are some of the baits that I'm throwing, how I'm working them. But today, I kind of want to take a deep dive into my methodology because I've had quite a few guys ask me. They say, look, you look like you're throwing into empty water or you're fishing a private lake or something along those lines. There's no way you're catching those bass, as many of them as you are, just going out on a public water and fishing. And I'm telling you, I promise you, I'm fishing a public lake. And also, I am mostly surrounded by other boaters. As a matter of fact, I have to edit out a lot of the chatter between myself and the other boaters. I can't show them on camera a lot of times because I don't want to risk one thing or the other, but as you can see by this video here, they're actually very close to me. This is when I caught that four pounder on that topwater walking bait the last time out. Nice job. Nice job. Appreciate it. So you see, there are other anglers around me and some of them are quite close. They see me catching fish and they want to come investigate. It's only natural, but I'm going to tell you how it is that I'm determining where I'm fishing, how whenever I put my boat in, I make a beeline exactly for where I'm going, and I know those fish are there. And I'll be honest, it's not really all that hard. One of the first things I do, well, I use past lake history. And I'm thinking about where are the traditional spawning pockets. I look on the lake using Google Earth and I'm breaking down those traditional spawning pockets. Now, those are going to be the first places that I'm going to target in that area, not back all the way into those creek arms and in those pockets and things like that, but near the outside edges, on humps, on points, on saddles, near the mouths of those creek arms, near the mouths of those pockets in that area, like we've talked about before, I'm looking for places that the bass can relate to because that's where they're going to be setting up. And let me tell you, they will be stacked. There will be dozens and dozens of fish all in the same area. I could make cast after cast after cast to the same stretch of water, and I'm pulling out five, six, seven fish from the same area. And as we saw in the last video, those fish are so aggressive that I'm actually getting two fish on one cast, two fish on one lure. You know, on an A-rig, that's not all that uncommon. But on a top water walking bait, I can't tell you the last time that I did that. And they were really nice fish. It was something very exceptional. And it got me really excited because when you see that, you know those bass are competing. They're competing for that bait. And when they're competing for the base like that, the feeding frenzy is on. So all you have to do when you're thinking about where you're going out on your lake, think about where are those traditional spawning pockets? Where are those bass setting up during the spawn 
year after year. Now back that out and go to the openings of those pockets and those creek arms and look for places those bass might want to set up. Main lake points, secondary lake points, humps, saddles, laydowns, riprap banks, up under docks. And if you find those places, I'm telling you what, those are going to be the single most productive spots on the water because the bass are all going to be grouping up, right? I watched guys live scoping all around the lake, staring at their feet all day and not catching anything. There was one guy in particular. He was in the same spot when I put my boat in the water and he was in the same spot when I left the lake a few hours later. I never once saw him catch a single fish. Now, to me, that just seems like he might have been enjoying himself. He might have been out there. He might have just been having fun. That's fine. But I would have moved. I would have done something a little bit more constructively. I would have figured out why this is not working. I'm seeing fish on my live scope, yet I'm not getting any bites. And I think he was throwing a drop shot. But if you're not in the right place at the right time, then your results are definitely not going to be as good as you want them to be. Now, warmer water is certainly a player. The water here right now in South Mississippi, we're getting into that lower 60s, that mid 60s. You know, it's still about five to eight degrees colder than it normally is. But I'm telling you what, those bass don't care. They are feeding up because they've got to do the spawn. They've got to get their bellies full. Now, some of the things that I'm doing, well, I have several different types of presentations tied on depending on what I see whenever I'm getting to the lake. Now, if I'm not seeing any bass bust, if I'm not seeing any action when I get out there to the spots that I know those bass are hiding, well, I've got something like this lipless crank tied on. And this is one of my homemade modified Cat Cordell super spots where I drill a hole in the belly and I fill it full of super glue and baking soda and it greatly reduces the rattle. For me, on a highly pressured body of water like what I'm fishing, this does wonders. It still has the advantages of a lipless crank. I can fish a little deeper. I can fish a little faster. I can fish, you know, almost like a jerkbait if I want to. You've seen me do that where I twitch it like a jerkbait. And that has gotten me a lot of strikes when those bass are aggressive. But I like one that has less rattles, especially whenever that water has a lot of other boats on it. I'm using that as a search bait. That's going to tell me where at in the pocket those hot spots are. Because there's going to be bass in clumps around those areas. You know, in the mouth of that creek arm, at the mouth of that pocket with the spawning bed in the back, you're going to find that the bass are going to be gathered around the bait fish that they're feeding on. So you've got to determine what are they feeding on? You know, are they feeding on bluegill? Are they feeding on shad? Are they feeding on craw? And a lot of times, different groups will target different prey species. Now, the last time I was out, I was having a bonanza on those bass that were targeting shad. I went after them with this, topwater walking bait by Yozuri. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it's called. I just know it's a Yozuri topwater walking bait. And I had this on my, you know, 7 to 1 uh, gear ratio with 30 pound braid. And I've got a short monofilament leader on there now. I had fluorocarbon but I changed it out to monofilament because I wanted that to be a dedicated topwater rod for a while and that's what's working great for me. I caught so many fish on that because those bass were actively busting. Now in that same pocket in that same area I could also throw something like this soft plastic jerk bait and this is just a regular cream right. These are the cheap ones at Walmart $1.25 a pack in that box on the bottom shelf. You see the packs of yum dingers, you see the packs of cream baits. And I have caught so many fish on these things. You know, they're great bait. I use them as a chatterbait trailer, and they also work quite well as a weightless fluke presentation simply because they're kind of heavy for a, a, a soft plastic jerk bait. So they've got a good bit of movement on the water. They dart side to side really well. I find them enticing at least. And from my experience, the bass find them enticing as well. And the last thing that I'm going to be looking for, the last thing that I'm going to be doing is something like, well, what we've talked about before. And this is the good old quarter ounce jig, three eighths ounce jig with a part of a stick bait trailer on the back of it. 
and I'm still getting bites with this. I don't know how many are going to be out in the middle. Got him. Oh, that's a toad. That's a tank. That's huge. That is huge. That is huge. Holy cow, honey. This one's a monster. Yeah, I'm recording. At least I hope I am. Yeah, I'm recording. Oh, and he choked it. That's a pretty one. He choked it. Told you. They're out here. Whew, look at how beautiful look at how much he choked that. So eh, I thought it was gonna be a monster monster, but he's I don't know two and a half pounds, probably about two pounds. <laughs> now, he didn't swallow it, but he, oh yeah, right in the roof of the mouth. But that tells me the bite is about on. Look at that honey. Oops, let me get that hand up. Well, now I need to be able to see. So, well, I guess that's good enough. Gorgeous bass, nice color. Oh, he's north of two, two and a quarter. Beautiful fish, beautiful. Again, it, it, it all depends on the activity level of those fish. It all depends on what their forage is, what they're going for. Some days they're going after the bluegill. Some days they're going after the crawfish that are on the bottom, some days they're chasing shad. So it pays to be able to attack all three areas of the water column in that way. I'm only fishing three, four feet of water at the most. It looks like I'm way off out in the deep end, but I'm not. These things can easily be done from the bank because those bass are easily within a cast length from the bank. A good place to look if you're having a hard time deciphering any place where those bass might be congregating, focus in on places where it looks like the bass can trap bait fish because that's what they're doing. They're using that bank to trap bait fish right along the edge and they swoop up onto the edge and you see a bunch of roiling and broiling right there at the edge as those bass start feeding and that's what they're doing. They're using that surface and that bank as a trap. If you can find an area, you know, that's got like a little bit steeper drop off or an area that's maybe got a pocket or a cutout in it, you know, that's right up next to the bank. I'm telling you, those can be golden. You can try something like a wacky rig in there. You might work finesse in there, you know, a finesse jig or, or a floating worm or something along those lines might do you very well. But in the pre-spawn, it's really not hard to locate where those bass are at they are readily available and it doesn't matter if you have electronics or if you don't have electronics i'm telling you look on google earth find those traditional spawning beds find where they traditionally spawn in those pockets and look backwards from that and find the target areas at the mouths of those creek arms and i'm telling you that's where the fish are that's where the activity is and you can really play with it once you get there and once you dial it in like I've been doing using different techniques until I find out what they're focused on and then it's fish after fish and it's probably some of the best fishing all year not just in numbers but also in the size of fish that you can catch. So there you have it, my method and techniques for breaking down the water in a pre-spawn and locating those bass really quickly. I use past history and I'm using Google Earth. I'm finding those traditional spawning pockets and I'm just moving out and looking for high percentage areas in those spots. That's what's working great for me and I know it can work great for you. Thanks for watching Lowbrow Fishing. We'll catch you in the next one.